this open problem session, which is an open session. <laughs> so uh, everyone is a speaker here. Whoever wants to have, you know, uh, have some questions, we could discuss here. So first, uh, I mean, since I don't have much experience running this uh, this thing, so I'll request our good friend uh, Keith Burns to just start off the process and. And I request, one request I make is that I would request all the graduate students out here to take down whatever is there on the board, just as a backup. This, everything is being recorded, but still I would request you to take down. So we might, you know, ask for your help at some point of time when you want to record the problems. <laughs> so with this I request Keith. Uh, yeah. Should I use, I should use this. Flow. Uh, um, is a Gordic. So this is with respect to the natural, like, because I'm called the Leoville measure. The Van Peterson Leoville measure. And there are various other stochastic properties other than ergodicity that are of interest to people. Um, there is mixing, there's something called the K property, there's the Bernoulli property. And the kind of uh, machinery of non-uniform hyperbolicity that I was at least implicitly appealing to in the talk gives all of these things. Uh, but then there are further questions people are interested in. Uh, one of them is um, sort of rates of mixing. Um, so if you have some function... Uh, know, if, say, from the moduli space to R, and you look at the integral from 0 to T, 1 over T, F of V T of V dt, this converges to um, the average of F almost everywhere. Uh, but then you want to measure how quickly this converges. And um, the, so you would conjecture that you might get exponential convergence, typically. So there's a question of how fast this rate of mixing happens. Um, and there's a lot of machinery due to Dolgopian for resolving this type of question. It should be applicable to this system. So you should be able to at least say something. So this actually seems like a reasonably feasible question that somebody will probably do soon. Uh, I don't think it will be me, but um, there are people out there who know how to do this sort of stuff. Uh, if you want to do it, get in there before they do. Um, there's another question that I'll just write briefly. This You can also think about the sort of range of values of this thing and see how it's distributed. And it should look as though you've got a, if you if you sort of normalize, if you kind of subtract off the mean, the value you should be getting and normalize suitably, you should get convergence of things to actually the normal distribution. At least one can hope. So for some dynamical systems with variable this sort of setup, you can actually get a central limit theorem. So that may work here. I'm not an expert on these types of questions, but um, the questions exist, and this is a setting in which they can be asked, and I suspect they will be answered. Uh, somebody here may want to be the person. So that's one thing. Uh, another question, so it's maybe question one. That was, that was one question. Well, maybe that's two questions. Uh, so the third question would be the question that actually Gerhard Knieper raised during the lecture. Uh, so you can think about closed orbits. Um, normally with the geodesic flow, what you do is you look at the closed orbits of length less than or equal to t, put equal mass around each one, then see how these, and then normalize the measure with all of this mass distributed on the closed orbits. And 
look to see what this converges to. Uh, it might be that with this um, Ray Peterson geodesic flow that you want to cut out extremely short closed orbits as well. But um, so we'll distribute mass along closed orbits of bounded length. and see what it converges to. And the experience with other examples, other hyperbolic examples, is that it converges to something significant. So one would hope that it does that again. And then the final question that I would suggest is, I explained in the talk that the cotangent bundle of the Type Miller space is some space of sections. Uh, I don't think I need to detail here exactly what they can be sorted out of the write up. And I explained that the, um, the L1 norm on these sections gives the Type Miller metric, and the L2 norm gives the Ray Peterson metric. Well, you can think about what about LP for other P. You get something. Uh, what can be said about it? There, I think, so far, nothing has been said. Um, I don't know quite what to expect. But there are some questions. So... Um, Maybe somebody else would like the microphone. Is there anyone else who um, would like to put down some questions? Can you formulate them clear statements to three statements? Yeah, I can, yeah. I, I can help do that later. Okay. Uh, that's it, it's an outline. Okay. Uh, he has. Uh, so there is closing lemma, uh, right? Uh, so I mean, it's like related to question two, I guess, but I'm just curious if you can prove it. Uh. Uh, this is a problem that I guess Lowell Jones and I thought about 20 years ago and then I think Pedro Antonato is thinking about it and it's, uh, it's still open I think and uh, so it might be this it's a call to say the question one let M in be a closed, so again, by this I mean boundary of M is empty, M is compact, negatively curved, well, I'll say closed Ramanian manifold. all of whose sectional curvatures are negative.
Now I want to look at a manifold that's homeomorphic to it, but has perhaps a different differential structure. And let in in be a homeomorphic smooth manifold. Must this manifold also support uh, uh, a negatively curved Riemannian metric? Always support uh, negatively curved. Negatively curved, just all sectional curvatures are negative. My feeling is there are probably examples where, it, where it's, the answer is no, but we don't know of any, any example. And sort of a, a special case of this, let me specialize a little bit more, or maybe a related problem, to let uh, Mn be a real hyperbolic manifold. sigma n be an exotic sphere. Does the connected sum always support negatively curved Romanian metric. So this is a special case of the, of the more general thing over here because this, this manifold here is a smooth manifold homeomorphic to this one. So this is a special case. But I can say more about this case in that if the injectivity radius of this is big enough, then the answer is true. So if injectivity radius of in this thing is sufficiently large, so I guess I could even make that kind of precise. So bigger than some number that depends only on the dimension. I think that's right. So bigger than some number uh, depending on n. So there, there's some real number depending on n. And if the injectivity radius of any hyperbolic manifold is bigger than that number, then this thing connected some with this supports a negatively curved metric. Sorry, say it again. Uh, I don't see who. Yeah, if. Uh, Sufficiently, no, yeah, uh, for, for, any, for any integer n, for, for any integer n, there's some number so that if the, in, say it again, do you worry about the quantifiers? Yeah, n equals 4. Oh, oh, yeah, n, yeah. 
So, yeah, I should say, if the injectivity radius of this is sufficiently large, and of course, and it should be bigger. I don't know anything about dimension four. Yeah. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> so, <laughs> so the thing is here that Lowell Jones and I were able to prove this, but I. Uh, Somehow, yeah, this is more tantalizing here, whether you really need that. I, my feeling is you need the big injectivity radius to do that, but I don't know. But this is a more, you know, more general statement there. Uh, oh, yeah, the universal cover is Rn. Yeah, if you take, so the universal cover of M is Rn, and if you take, well, I think I can. I think that's true. I mean, if you take the connected sum of R, Rn, with one exotic sphere, it's Rn. And of course, when you go to the universal cover of this thing, you're going to have a whole bunch of them. But I think you can kind of group them together and, and do that. I, th I think that will be OK. OK, that's even better. <laughs> that's even better, yeah. I guess my, my former student, uh, Boris Okun, has sort of examples there where maybe Pat suggested this problem. You take a non-positively curved symmetric space. You know, I guess it should be irreducible. And you connected summit with uh, exotic sphere. And sometimes you can do that connected summing and actually change the differential structure. And then I guess it would contradict your work and Gromov's work if that were non positively curved. Pardon? Higher rank, yeah, higher rank symmetric space. Uh, and so whether or not you Yeah, that's true. It's just Boris was able to construct ones where the differential structure changed, but it's it's not not trivial to show differential structures change when you do something. That's, that's the problem. And uh, I guess maybe the third question is the one I, I ended my talk with on Tuesday. So let uh, E, P, B, B, uh, smooth bundle, smooth, smooth fiber bundle, whose fibers are, whose fibers are closed negatively curved Ramanian manifolds. Now, I guess I could put two versions of this down. One is where, where B is simply connected, and the other the more, a more general statement. So. Uh, let me put that version down first. If B is simply connected, must this bundle always be tri topologically trivial? precise, i.e., there exists a continuous map, say, f from e 
to m. So m will be, uh, so let's see, let this be a smooth fiber bundle whose, whose uh, fibers, I'll call it the, sort of the, the standard fibers, m. So m is a, is a manifold. It's got many different differential structures on it. So does there exist a continuous map from E to M, which is a homeomorphism when restricted to each fiber? fiber of P. More generally, if the base space is not simply connected, then you have to require the bundle as fiber homotopically trivial, but I can state that a little more concretely. So in general, assume that the bundle is trivial in some marked fashion. In general, assume In addition, that there exists a map, a continuous map, phi. I want to eventually try to get a, a, a better continuous map. There exists a continuous map phi from E to M which induces an isomorphism on the fundamental groups of every fiber, such that for each fiber, such that restricted each fiber, F induces an isomorphism on pi 1 between the fundamental groups of the fiber and the fundamental group of the kind of generic fiber, then must the conclusion hold? Then is uh, E topologically trivial? So I guess those are my questions. Uh, just again, uh, are there any comments or questions on, on Farrell's questions? This one here. One. Can we uh, answer to the question if we um, further assume, I mean, we want the manifold N to be isometric to M? In? So we know that it's homeomorphic. Right. If it's diffeomorphic, it's true. True. It's it's true. Yeah. Now I want. Uh, I wonder if there exists some some uh, Riemannian structure on N, such that now M and N are isometric. I mean, this is a so so this is a. I mean, this is a smooth manifold here. Mm -hmm. So the question is: Is there uh, some other manifold structure? Well, what did I put here? Did I let N be a homeomorphic smooth manifold? So, so these two are smooth manifolds. This one's just homeomorphic to that one. Mm -hmm. This one's got a... I'm uh, just requiring more, so it okay. should be easy to say, no, it's not possible. I must be specific. Well, they, they have the thing is, what I think is, the key thing is, can you find a, an example? Uh, in, in both directions, it's, if you can find a huge amount of cases by putting more constraints on where the answer is yes, that would be great. Or if you can find one counterexample, that would be great. Either way, and, and I should say over here, actually, we've investigated the case where instead of real hyperbolic, it could be 
complex hyperbolic, actually with Aravinda we considered the quaternionic and the Cayley case. And again, we had positive results if injectivity radius is big enough. Oh yeah, there was another, yeah, maybe a, a final fourth question is that the, that the techniques that, that Aravinda and I used, you really didn't need the symmetric space structure to get these positive results. All you needed was a big chunk. You, you needed a, di a big disk from real hyperbolic space isometrically embedded in your manifold. So if you could take your negatively curved metric and change it so that it became real hyperbolic in a big area, then you could get lots of nice positive results. And, my f and that's how we dealt with the complex hyperbolic and the quaternionic and the Cayley. And I'm wondering if the thing is strictly quarter pinched, whether you can always, by maybe some Ricci flow thing, arrange that you have a, change the metric so that you have a big, well, you have a, you know, if the injectivity radius is big enough, you can change the met, that metric so that you have a big, a big ball isometric to a ball in real hyperbolic space embedded in it. That, that, would be, that would be very nice if you could do, for, do something like that. But pi naught is not finitely generated there. Yeah, it's got all this other stuff. It's got a lot of stuff in there. But it doesn't have stuff coming from outer, only a little bit comes from outer automorphisms. But yet, you want to exclude all that by your hypothesis. Yeah. I guess it should, yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah just a question. Yes. Uh, to what extent two implies one? Uh, in other words, besides oh, uh, yeah. constructions, I mean, besides constructions involving, so the constructions I know for yeah. getting are either glue in the sphere, glue it in fiber wise into a bundle of the sphere, which is another thing you guys did. Yeah. And then, then there's some other tricks that out of Inda you guys had, yeah. um, for example. Uh, to get like mentioned five, and uh, besides those, is is that do you think that that actually exhausts all the possibilities? So well, I, you, you, you can really analyze really pretty well what the smooth structures are, and and as you say, this is kind of there's there's sort of in kind of correspondence to the homology groups of the manifold with some sort of finite coefficients, so. This thing sort of corresponds to like the zeroth homology. So you're taking the zeroth homology of a manifold is just you take a point and you take a neighborhood of the point, you remove it and stick in an exotic sphere. From the first homology group, you could take a geodesic, remove a tubular neighborhood of the geodesic, and re-glue it back in with sort of a twist. And that could change the differential structure. You could take a, now I did the geodesic just for, for kind of metric reasons, but the, if I forget about metrics, I can do that, just take a simple closed curve in there, remove it. If I had an embedded two torus in there, I could, well, of course, I guess in hyperbolic, well, you could be embedded without being on the fundamental group. But I could remove, well, I could remove any sort of two-dimensional surface, in fact inside of there, take a tubular neighborhood of it, and re-glue it back in by this thing on the boundary. That could change the differential structure. Then there's one other thing, and you, you go up the bigger and bigger sub-things in there. Or you can change the piecewise linear structure, and that gets more delicate. And uh, that's a sort of a Kirby-Siebelman thing, but you can, you can do that too. 
So there, there are many ways, but basically, if you understand this way, if you understand connected sum, you can kind of run with the ball and try to do other things. But it gets, it gets more complicated, though. I just wanted one question about uh, mm -hmm. if it makes sense to ask a slightly finer one. Uh, instead of demanding that n is homeomorphic, if we say n is geodesically conjugate to m, that should perhaps be oh, oh, homeomorphic. Mean, it's slightly finer. I mean, you could make it stronger. You mean so having the same Mark link spectrum? Yeah, same Mark link spectrum. Then, uh, oh, oh, then right. Then admit negative leak out. That's a little stronger form of the operation, I suppose. Stronger. Oh, you mean you, it, it, so, so you start with M as a negatively curved one, and exactly. N is, a, is, a, is one with a metric on it. It's yeah. not negatively it's curved. Which is geodesically conjugate. Let's say oh, geodesically oh, conjugate I see. Yeah. MN. Then would N admit a metric of negative conjugation? I don't know. I don't know. Yeah, that would uh, be, that'd be and interesting, that's too. That's little, yeah, yeah that, that, would, that would certainly be very interesting. So this was this business where he had this, he had some expression like this written, whatever it was, maybe there was a square root in there or something, but his, his question was, so I'm not getting the hypothesis completely right. We had uh, x, con x contained in some manifold mn plus 1, which maybe was hyperbolic, somebody who listened to the talk better than I did should say, hyperbolic or maybe just compact, negatively curved. And, and we had this hypersurface in it, and we had the, its principal curvatures, and it, the question was, if some symmetric polynomial Any, if, if any symmetric polynomial, I think, uh, in the KIs or KI squareds is constant, does that imply that X is locally symmetric? I got that wrong? Okay. So the question was, you have this type, you have this, you can figure a manifold M. Right. And then you have the, uh, the function uh, because of all the other spheres. And then it is defined the function of the unit tangent bundle, which is this exactly as you, what you write above. You have all the horror spheres in, he, in here. Right. Yeah. For every point yeah. in the horror sphere, you have this function, which is a product of the of one plus k i square of, uh, I mean, where long i the principal curvature of the right. sphere. So if this function is constant over the unit tangent bundle, then the manifold should be locally symmetric. So the generalization of the Vishnevovich conjecture where, where you take the sum of the k i. Okay, maybe you should come up here and write that down more. a unit tangent bundle. So the function f of n is exactly what we wrote here, which is 
is a product of the eye. Square of n. So what, what does this mean? So ki of n is so r the principal curvature curvature of uh, of the orosphere through n by which I mean I have n have my orosphere have all these functions so now the question is uh, so if f is equal to a constant then does this imply that m is uh, locally symmetric? Uh, and the reason why that uh, it's the analogous of the Lishnerovich conjecture. So the Lishnerovich conjecture is whenever you take the sum of the ki, and the fact that the function is, is constant implies that the manifold is locally symmetric. So he is now interested in this function of the principal curvature. Does this make sense? Yeah. It does also make sense, but... Uh, he was talking to you about also these equidistant surfaces of in hyperbolic space, right? So that not okay, so maybe there were two catch questions, right? <laughs> but that's the one he, he asked me in my office in, uh, in Orsay, so... <laughs> okay, so let's say it's two questions. <laughs> there's two questions, right? Okay, yeah, I don't have anything else. Yeah, uh, maybe I just ex explain this uh, question huh. about vanishing sequences, which was maybe not clear. So let gamma be the fundamental group of a surface. Uh, let P of gamma be the set of primitive elements. I mean, those which are not powers of, of, of other guys. So, you now say the definition, say gamma and eta, which belong to P and gamma, are, let's say, nice to, if uh, they can be, they are represented by Embedded geodesics with zero or one intersection point. Okay, so this is nice, and this is not nice. Okay, so. So now observe that if gamma prime in gamma is of finite index, then we have a bijection between the primitive element of gamma prime and the primitive element of gamma. Just correspond to the endpoints of the geodesic. So now definition. So we have gamma, we have a sequence gamma n plus one of subgroup of finite index of gamma. So we say this is vanishing if gamma given for all gamma eta in P of gamma, gamma on eta are nice, it should be the couple gamma eta is nice, uh, for in P of gamma n for n large enough. Okay? So 
this notion, we just use the fact that we have bijection between the uh, primitive elements. So now the question is, uh, is a random, is there is actually two questions. Is the random sequence of a of, uh, of finite index subgroup Uh, vanishing, and of course the second question is define random. Because if you consider all the cover of a given of a, all the finite index subgroup, there are infinitely many of them, so you don't want to make them. Uh, you have to define a measure on the space of on the subgroup of finite index, and then to define the. Uh, try to understand the random works in this uh, graph of, uh, of object. So maybe the answer is different for different measure that you can define on this space of uh, on this random works on the uh, finite subgroups, finite index subgroups. Is this clear? Because people complain that this was not clear. In the Thank you. Um, and not exactly in the sense of conjugacy classes of primitive element. And it's not a question about conjugacy classes, I'm sorry. It's not a question about conjugacy classes. It's really a question about primitive elements. So primitive elements correspond to a pair of endpoints in the boundary at infinity. Conjugacy classes is something different. It's really about primitive elements. Well, this is too long a question. It's more than 10 lines. I'm sorry about that. Okay, thank you. Uh, anyone else? Uh, that is?
zero, then Lafont just told you how to do it. Yeah, the <coughs> you can always see uh, Farrell's question was about a negatively curved manifold which is homeomorphic to a smooth manifold. You can always pull back the distance function to the homeomorphic manifold by the homeomorphism. Then you get a cat in the negative curvature and I still I don't, I don't see the connection uh, I think what he was saying was that via the homeomorphism you pull back the distance function of the negatively curved metric that would make uh, the other one uh, cat minus one. Oh, you mean as a way of getting a counter example if, if there was a counter example my I question yeah, 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 okay, yeah I but, suppose but, yeah. that's how it's reflected so that this is a more a more general question. Yeah. I think so. Yeah. Uh, any questions, Pat or Laden? Edson? Yeah. Uh, this is this is not a question. This is an advertisement <laughs> for a group. Uh, uh, there is a paper of Gromov in which he claims that we should never forget hyperbolic geometry in infinite dimension. He claims that the hyperbolic space of uh, infinite dimension is much more sexy than the uh, poor low dimensional, finite dimensional hyperbolic uh, space. Uh, it's more sexy. <laughs> this is, I, <laughs> I forgot. <laughs> anyway, so I want to mention in, in the talk of Martin Brighton, uh, he uh, began explaining some kind of families of groups, the mapping class group, uh, SLNZ, uh, etc., etc., and they should look the same. So I would like just want to add one group in this list, uh, a, a sequence of groups in this list that we should not forget. This is the Cremona group. So uh, let me explain what it is and let me tell you why uh, I am kind of disappointed that nobody here mentioned this group I during this meeting, meeting because these groups are, at least the first one, is really negatively curved and we should uh, understand it using negative curvature and uh, most of the people here have tools to use it and to, to, to study it, uh, 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 tools that people from algebraic geometry usually don't have. So uh, the Cremona group, uh, let's say in CP2, is just a group of uh, birational transformations for CP, from CP2 to CP2. So it's a map which is in homogeneous coordinates, maps X, Y, Z to three polynomials, P, X, Y, Z, homogeneous polynomials. Uh, 
and which is such that it has an inverse, which is homog uh, polynomial 2. So a typical example would be uh, x, y, z goes to 1 over x, 1 over y, 1 over z. But of course, these are, these are not polynomials. But if you multiply the three coordinates by x, y, z, you get y, z, x, z, and x, y. But if, I, if you write it this way, you see that this is a map which has order 2, and it is not defined everywhere. So you should think of this group as acting not on CP2, because it's not defined everywhere. To make it well-defined, you have to blow up points. And the points where you have to blow, it, blow him up to define it depend on the map. So, the, so if it's not a group which is acting on a space. It's a group which is kind of locally defined. And if you want to make it global, there is an idea coming from Manin that he called the bubble space. which is you take the complex projective plane and you blow it up in all possible points. And you blow it up again on all possible points and again and again and again and again. And, so, and you look at the inverse limit of this process. It's kind of a complex surface which is kind of crazy because it's blowing, it's blowing up everywhere. And this complex surface does not quite exist, but at least it has some homology. And the homology its second homology is a space which has intersection form, and the intersection form is hyperbolic form, which has signature 1, 1 plus, minus, 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 infinite number of minus. So really, this group, this Cremona group, does act in the, in the real, in the classical sense, acts on the infinite dimensional hyperbolic space. And this fact has not been used too much uh, uh, as of today. And I just want to mention one recent theorem by uh, Quanta and um, uh, Lamy. They proved using that that the group, the Cremona group, is not a simple group. And their proof is really a hyperbolic geometry group. They are using Gromov type arguments. They are using small constellations, uh, Dane diagrams, uh, all these techniques that many of, you are many of you are familiar. And this was kind of a shock for people from algebraic geometry because, for example, for, from, for Jean Pierre Serre, was really surprised that techniques that from hyperbolic geometry could be used to show that the Cremona group is not a simple group. But this, is, I think, is the, the beginning of a, of, of a long story. Uh, we have many, we, you have many tools, like uh, uh, coming from hyperbolic geometry. They should be imported to this group. And for example, many questions. Uh, what about uh, uh, the structure of amenable subgroups? or? Uh, what could be lattices in this uh, uh, um, Cremona group, etc., cetera, etc., cetera. and to uh, uh, to connect that with the talk of uh, Martin Brightson, of course, the Cremona group in dimension two is the first in a long series of Cremona groups in dimension three, four, five, etc., cetera, etc., cetera. and for these we know nothing. So they would be something like higher rank symmetric spaces, and uh, we know nothing. We don't know a single significant theorem concerning them. So this was just a, a, a page of advertisement. I think it's a nice topic. I think many of you have tools in their pockets to study this group, and uh, uh, you should do it. OK, thank you. That sort of reminded me of uh, surfaces, where they start with real projective space sequence of finer and finer triangulations and they blow. And, and take blow some kind of limit. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah. But you want to do it at not just the dense set. It's it everywhere. Set. It's something like a real tree. It's something to do with. OK. This one, this one does not exist. Eh? It has homology. Um, any more questions?
questions. Actually, it's about 3.30. Anyway, that's our schedule break time, but that's okay. So if there is consensus and if we think there are questions, we could come back after the break also. But before that, I just want to just make a small uh, announcement. Uh, actually, we are thinking of bringing some conference proceedings. And what uh, uh, sort of uh, we have done a preliminary work on that. We have approached, uh, actually, Jean Lafont has done all the work. So he has approached the London Math Society, uh, and uh, I think in principle they're agreeable, except that once we have some percentage of our material ready, so we could, uh, you know, put it on some web page and they could see and uh, agree to publish. And uh, so we, this, whatever problems were discussed in the problem session, also we would like to put a certain section in that proceedings. Um, and in the proceedings, uh, uh, maybe, uh, Maybe it's not out of place to say, sort of what we are envisaging is uh, not so much emphasis on research articles, but emphasis on uh, survey articles, uh, in, you know, covering different aspects of negative curvature that has been discussed here. So uh, basically I'm just sounding off people who would be interested or who have already some material ready to keep it reserved for these proceedings. <laughs> um, Um, yeah, more or less like that, I think. Email me and uh, Jean Lafont, I think, both of us, yeah. Basically, expository articles, not so much the research articles. That's what we are envisaging, yeah. yeah. So, so maybe should we just have a break and come back, I suppose, um, if there's consensus and if there could be more questions, I'm sure. Yeah? Yeah, why not? I mean, since I think... Uh, uh, I think the steam is still going until 3.30, so <laughs> we can just get some coffee and, and come back, and maybe as long as it goes, we could. Uh, we'll come back uh, exactly for half an hour break, uh, the standard thing, yeah.